Hello everyone, and welcome to another entry in the Word Origin series. As you will hopefully have gleaned from the title, the topic of this video is indeed the humble noun guy. According to the Cambridge English Dictionary, guy is defined as, quote, a man. Though it does also note that in recent decades it has become increasingly gender neutral when used in reference to a group. It is about as generic a word as you can find in the modern English language, and at first blush may not appear to warrant a dedicated video such as this one by such a widely known and well respected YouTube channel as Real History. So, Guy. In its original form, Guy was a name, the French analogue of the Italian name Guido. In French, it was pronounced Guy, as in Guy de Lusignan. The name was transported across the English Channel when the Normans conquered England in 1066, where it would eventually assume its current pronunciation within the English language. And obviously, it is a name that is still in use, if pretty uncommon, at least as far as I can tell. But anyway, how did a name evolve into a generic word for a man? The answer lies in the most famous guy of them all, Guy Fawkes. But first, some background. At the turn of the 17th century, Europe was bitterly divided along religious lines as a result of the Protestant Reformation. These divisions would later trigger the European wars of religion, which would consume most of the continent for the rest of the century and lead to the deaths of millions. Since the reign of Henry VIII, England had been roiled by intense social and political conflict between Protestants and Catholics. There was a brief resurgence of Catholicism in England during the reign of Queen Mary I, also known as Bloody Mary, for her persecution and burning of hundreds of Protestants. And if you're wondering if this is where the cocktail gets its name, it is one of several proposed origins, but no one really knows for sure. After Mary's death in 1558 and the accession of her sister, Elizabeth, a devout Protestant, English Catholics had been oppressed. When James I assumed the throne in 1603, Catholic hopes of greater tolerance quickly faded and the policies of oppression looked set to continue. Indeed, throughout his reign, James came under intense pressure from his advisers to become even less tolerant towards Catholics. In 1604, a small group of dissident English Catholics formed a plan to assassinate both King James and his son Henry, the Prince of Wales, and then place his nine-year-old daughter Elizabeth on the throne as a Catholic head of state. This was to be achieved in spectacular fashion, by blowing up the Palace of Westminster during the state opening of Parliament on the 5th of November, 1605. The conspirators actually managed to hide 36 large barrels of gunpowder in the undercroft directly beneath the House of Lords. Modern reenactments have discovered that the explosion would have been powerful enough to kill anyone within a hundred meters. These guys certainly weren't leaving anything to chance. According to their plan, one of their number would remain in the Undercroft to light the fuse at the appointed time before making his escape. That man was Guy Fawkes. However, it seems that in the weeks leading up to the big day, some among the conspirators expressed their concern for the safety of the few Catholics present in the House of Lords. Just over a week before the state opening, an anonymous letter was sent to William Parker, Baron of Monteagle, warning him not to attend the state opening. As it happened, this would prove to be a big mistake. Justifiably concerned, Monteagle passed the letter on to the Earl of Salisbury, chief royal adviser and spymaster to the king. Salisbury in turn passed it on to James, and the king apparently deduced from the use of the word blow that the threat involved gunpowder. The King's soldiers were ordered to search Parliament from top 
to bottom. And lo and behold, in the undercroft, they discovered forks and either a suspicious pile of firewood or a pile of coal, depending on who you're talking to. In any case, further investigation revealed the 36 barrels of gunpowder, and Fawkes was also found to be carrying a pocket watch and several slow fuses. He was, of course, immediately arrested, and just like that, the so-called gunpowder plot had been foiled. Subsequent investigations, including the torture of Fawkes to the point where he could barely sign his own confession, led to the arrest of the remaining conspirators, all of whom were found guilty of high treason and executed. The 5th of November quickly became a day of celebration for the people of England, with the use of fireworks to commemorate the foiling of the gunpowder plot. Now, as far as I'm concerned, holding a massive display of fireworks to celebrate the foiling of a plot to blow up Parliament has the same kind of energy as taking a Prime Minister who drowned while in office and naming a public pool after him. Anyway, back to the story. The 5th of November became known variously as Fireworks Night, Guy Fawkes Night, and Bonfire Night. Children constructed effigies of Fawkes, dressed in old clothes and wearing a grotesque mask. These effigies became known as Guys, and they were traditionally thrown onto the bonfires to burn. By the 19th century, a guy had come to mean an oddly dressed individual. When the word was imported into American English, it was deprived of its cultural context and thus lost its pejorative associations. By the 20th century, in America, it had come to simply mean any male person, similar to the word chap. With the spread of American culture during the 20th century, the word, with its new, generic meaning, was re-imported back into the language of the mother country and all of its associated territories. Now, this next part is not particularly important, but I'm going to say it anyway. The famous Guy Fawkes mask, which I am absolutely certain you have come across at some point or another, achieved international notoriety largely due to its use in the V for Vendetta comic series and the subsequent 2005 movie adaption. Now, masks have long been part of the tradition associated with the 5th of November, but this particular mask design was created by V for Vendetta illustrator David Lloyd. It has since become the only Guy Fawkes mask. There is no other. But this mask's only real connection to Guy Fawkes is the name. It's called the Guy Fawkes mask, but really it is associated with the fictional character who first wore it, V from V for Vendetta. I mean, I'm assuming it's now associated more with V, who was an anarchist resisting a fascist regime, because I really don't think that a man who plotted to blow up the seat of government, kill the king, his 11-year-old son, all the politicians in the country, and everyone else who just happened to be in the building, or within 100 metres of it, before forcibly converting a nine-year-old girl to Catholicism and placing her on the throne as a puppet, is really someone to be admired. Besides, I think we have a word for that kind of behaviour. It's a bit like that famous image of Che Guevara. Sure, He might now be associated with freedom, rebellion, and counterculture, but in reality, he was a hardcore Marxist revolutionary insurgent who wanted to destroy the capitalist world order through violence and build a Marxist utopia upon its ashes. In fact, now that I have brought up Che Guevara, I feel like pointing out that the great irony is that the image of possibly the most outspoken anti-capitalist you can possibly imagine has been completely and utterly commodified, to the point where it is now one of the most recognisable images in the world. But anyway, where were we? Ah yes, the legacy of the gunpowder plot has many interesting strands, some less well known than others. One such strand is that to this day, the ceremonial state opening of Parliament in the United Kingdom 
begins with the yeoman of the guard conducting a search of the cellars beneath the palace of Westminster, just to make absolutely sure. Another strand is in the form of a nursery rhyme, which is actually recited in V for Vendetta as well, but I figured it was a good way to end this video, so here it is. Remember, remember, the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason, and plot. For I see no reason why gunpowder, treason, should ever be forgot. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you like and subscribe. And if you're feeling extra generous, leave a comment below. You know, for algorithm purposes. For more great history content, you can head to the Real History website via the link in the description, and you can also find Real History on various social media platforms, where I post content that I don't post anywhere else. This includes a bunch of really cool maps, and a heap of character profiles on historical figures. Finally, as always, thank you so much to my Patreon members for your ongoing support, if you're thinking about becoming a patron, click the link in the description to find out what kind of benefits you can get. Once again, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.